Hi, my name is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast of the New Testament. I'll be using as the text the King James Version, along with the Joseph Smith Translation. Although this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort's been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. I'll also be using quotes from general authorities of the Church, the Apostles and Prophets, and BYU professors and others, and uh, every word out of the Scriptures themselves. So if you're ready for a really detailed analysis of the New Testament, you've come to the right place. Welcome. Hello there. Welcome back. This is going to be for 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The heading reads, Christ died for our sins. He rose from the dead and was seen by many. All men will be resurrected. Paul speaks of baptism for the dead, the three degrees of glory. Victory over death comes through Christ. The apostle now expounds on the reality, glories, and mysteries of the resurrection that glorious doctrine that all men shall live again in immortality. That was by Bruce R. McConkie. Joseph Fielding Smith said, In the resurrection there will be different kinds of bodies. They will not all be alike. The body a man receives will determine his place hereafter. There will be celestial bodies, terrestrial bodies, and telestial bodies, and these bodies will differ as distinctly as do bodies here. Some will gain celestial bodies with all the powers of exaltation and eternal increase. These bodies will shine like the sun, as our Savior's does, as described by John. Those who enter the terrestrial kingdom will have terrestrial bodies, and they will not shine like the sun, but they will be more glorious than the bodies of those who receive the telestial glory. Alrighty, let's begin. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. The fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, rose again the third day, and ascended up into heaven, and all other things are only appendages to these, which pertain to our religion. That was by Joseph Smith. Verse 5, And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above, five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, he's speaking of the Lord's brother, or half-brother, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. For I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so we so ye believed. So I guess Paul must have probably traveled farther than all the apostles. Maybe that's what he's referring to here when he did more than the other ones. Anyway, verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. In other words, Jesus, in order to be the Messiah, had to be raised up, and the resurrection proves that he was the Son of God, or that he is the Son of God. Verse 16, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are not yet in your sin. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished or destroyed. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now in Christ, risen from the dead, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. The fact of our Lord's resurrection and the consequent immortality thereby passed on to all men lies at the heart and core and center of Christianity. Unless Christ was resurrected, he was not the Son of God. Unless he inherited from an immortal father the power of immortality, he was, as other men, incapable of bursting the bands of death for himself and for all men. The resurrection proves the divine sonship, and the divine sonship is established by the fact of resurrection. The two are inseparably connected, both are true, or neither is. And that was by Bruce R. McConkie. I think I mentioned that sort of, didn't I? Not as good as he did. Verse 21, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 
Joseph F. Smith said, Every creature that is born in the image of God will be resurrected from the dead by the power of Jesus Christ. It matters not whether we have done well or ill, whether we have been intelligent or ignorant, or whether we have been bondsmen or slaves or freemen. All men will be raised from the dead, the second death. Uh, it's also noteworthy to mention that also all living things that have spirits will also be resurrected. Animals, plants, this earth, everything that has a spirit will also be resurrected. Um, and that's uh, that'll be, at least for everything, the final resurrection will happen at the end of the millennium. Verse 23, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. The most righteous man was first, the most wicked shall be the last. Christ was first, the sons of perdition shall be last. That was by Brother McConkie. The order of resurrection will be the following. At the second coming of Christ, Doctrine and Covenants section 88 mentions, and they who have slept in their graves shall come forth, for their graves shall be opened, and they also shall be caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven. They are Christ's, the first fruits, they who shall descend with him first, and they who are on the earth and in their graves, who are first caught up to meet him, and in all this by the voice of the sounding of the trump of the angel of God. The next group is verse 99, and after this another angel shall sound, which is the second trump, and then cometh the redemption of those who are Christ's at his coming, who have received their part in that prison which is prepared for them, that they might receive the gospel and be judged according to men in the flesh. These are they who live the terrestrial law. They include the heathen nations who died without the law of the gospel, others who rejected the gospel in this life, but received it in the spirit world, others who were honorable men by the standards of the world, but who were blinded spiritually, and yet others who were numbered with the saints of God, but who did not endure it to the end and were not valiant in defense of truth and righteousness. They shall come forth in the latter part of the first resurrection and enter into a terrestrial kingdom. Afterward cometh the resurrection of damnation, and the forepart of this final resurrection shall come forth those whose inheritance is the celestial world, and in the latter part those who are as sons of perdition, shall be cast out with Lucifer and his rebel hosts forever. Back to section 88, and again another trump shall sound, which is the third trump, and then come the spirits of men who are to be judged and are found under condemnation. And these are the rest of the dead, and they live not again until the thousand years are ended, neither again until the end of the earth. And another trump shall sound, which is the fourth trump, saying, These there are found among those who are to remain until that great and last day, even the end, who shall remain filthy still. And he's speaking there about the sons of perdition. Verse 24, Afterward cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father shall he, get, shall he ha when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy, death, shall be destroyed. For he saith, when it is manifest, that he hath put all things under his feet, and that all things are put under, he is expected of the Father who did put all things under him. And when all things are, shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? In other words, baptized in behalf of or for the sake of the dead. If there is no resurrection, then why perform baptisms for the dead? That's what he's getting to here. That's the argument that he's making about the resurrection is why would we then baptize people uh, by proxy? Joseph Smith said, Every man that has been baptized and, and belongs to the kingdom has a right to be baptized for those who have gone before. And as soon as the law of the gospel is obeyed here by their friends who act as proxy for them, the Lord has administrators there to set them free. In other words, those in spirit prison, when they hear the message of the gospel and accept baptism, and the baptismal ordinance is actually performed in their behalf, then they are set free out of spirit prison, and then they can go into spirit paradise. Joseph Fielding Smith said, Salvation for the dead was understood in the days of the primitive Christian church, and to some extent baptisms for the dead continued to be performed until about A.D. 379, when the Council of Carthage forbade any longer the administration of this ordinance and holy communion for the dead. An article in the Belfast Telegraph, 28th of August, 2008, by Eamon McCain, he says, What if Mormons are right and Catholics are, and Protestants wrong? Given Christian teaching, does it make more sense to baptize dead adults rather than live than live babies? Why are Catholic bishops so concerned about Mormons baptizing dead parishioners? The Mormons didn't invent baptism for the dead. The practice was a significant history, 
has a significant history within mainstream Christianity. The decision to order its abandonment was taken only after heated debate and was a close-run thing. What's the difference, anyway, between baptizing the dead and baptizing babies? A tiny infant will have as much understanding as a dead person, none at all, of the complex philosophical belief system it's been induct- being inducted into when baptized, say a Catholic. Transubstantiation. There's daily communicants go to their deaths without any clear understanding of the concept, so what chance the, the muling taught? Indeed, given that all Christian churches believe that the soul lives on after death and retains understanding and consciousness of self, doesn't it make more sense to baptize dead adults than live babies? Apart from which, if the Catholic bishops hold that the beliefs of the Mormons are purely baloney, as they must, and their rituals therefore perfectly meaningless, how can it matter to them what mumbo-jumbo Mormons might mutter over Catholic cadavers. The current controversy has been prompted by Archbishop Demott Clement, uh, Clifford and Bishop Bill Murphy complaining to the National Library in Dublin about record handed, records handed over by the church being made available to all and sundry. The Mormons are believed to have taken advantage of this facility to comb through parish records and baptize the souls enumerated therein a batch at a time. The bishops stepped in after the Vatican warned all national churches earlier this year about Mormons misusing diocese and diocese records of the church. I have heard it suggested that the alarm of the Holy See had escalated after reports that Mormon multiple baptisms were regularly breaking the official record set by General uh, Louis Kung Lee, who in one afternoon baptized seven regiments of Chinese soldiers into Christianity with a fire hose. Let's look at the facts as understood by the early followers of Christ. For more than 300 years after the crucifixion, baptism of the dead was widely accepted. Its biblical basis located in 1 Corinthians. Otherwise, what shall they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for them? In other words, a deceased person could be baptized by proxy. Otherwise, how could such a person be included in the resurrection? A good question. The radical Corinthians and the Marcionites were especially energetic baptizers of the dead. It was it was to wrong foot these sects, seen as competitors with the official church at a time when it was consolidating its position as the state religion of the Roman Empire, that the synodes of Hoppo and Carthage voted after bitter debate to condemn the practice. Interestingly, a clear trace of baptism of the dead has lingered in official practice to the present day in the form of prayers for divine intercession on behalf of the unbaptized souls. Prayers of intervention were encouraged in Catholic schools in the 1950s. For all I know, this remains the case. Baptizing the dead might be seen as analogous, too, to the Jewish prayer of intercession, which serves as a reminder that U.S. Jews put a halt to galloping post-mortem Mormonism a couple years ago by arguing that the Judaizing those who'd perished in the concentration camps constituted a profound insult to Holocaust victims. Following talks in New York between leaders of the two religions, the Mormons backed off. The key point is, surely that all religions believe that the soul after death at last knows what's what, whether Hinduism, Free Presbyterianism, Jainism, Judaism, Islam, Catholicism, or whatever is the true religion. What if it's Mormonism? What if it's an everyday occurrence on the other side that Catholics and Protestants are left standing dumbstruck at the gates, gasping? Mormons? Who'd have believed it? And maybe a wife beating her husband or berating her husband there, there I told you it would be the Mormons. But would you listen? Now it's eternal hellfire for the two of us. I hope you're satisfied. In that scenario, shouldn't all members of all other religions be literally eternally grateful to the Mormons for sharing their saving grace even unto and after death? If, on the other hand, it isn't the Mormons at all, those who turn out to have been right can wave a merry farewell to the crestfallen followers of Brigham Young as they trundled downwards to their eternal comeuppance. What's the problem? So, so you can see this guy here is uh, adamant that uh, what's the harm in, in the fact that Mormons baptize people for the dead or uh, that are deceased? Um, let them do it. If it's true, it's true. If it's not, so what? I like that. That's very funny. Anyway, hope you got something out of that too. Verse 30, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest unto you the resurrection of the dead, and this is my rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, daily though I die. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me? If the dead rise not, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some man will say... 
How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? They must rise just as they died. We can there hail our lovely infants with the same glory, the same loveliness, and the celestial glory where they all enjoy alike. They differ in status, in size. The same glorious spirit gives them the likeness of glory and bloom. The old man with his silvery hairs will glory and bloom and beauty. No man can describe it to you. No man can write it. That was by Joseph Smith. There is no fundamental principle belonging to a human system that ever goes into another in this world or in the world to come. I care not what the theories of men are. We have the testimony that God will raise us up, and he has the power to do it. If anyone, if anyone supposes that any part of our bodies, that is, the fundamental parts thereof, ever goes into another body, he is mistaken. Again, that was by Joseph Smith. I guess that was before transplants were done. Um, but I'm thinking that what he means here is that even though we have transplants today, uh, that, that we'll have to wait until the resurrection, until the person's done with uh, borrowing our parts. I, I guess that's what that means. Verse 36, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body which shall be but grain. It may be of wheat or some other. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and so to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. Are also celestial. There are also celestial bodies. In section 76 we read, And again we bear record, for we saw and heard that this is the testimony of the gospel of Christ concerning them who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just. If they are they who, re they are they who received the testimony of Jesus and believed on his name and were baptized after the manner of his burial, being buried in the water in his name, and this according to the commandment which he has given, that by keeping the commandments they, get, they might be washed and cleansed from all their sins and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of the hands of him who is ordained and sealed into this power, and who overcome by faith and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. They are they who are the church of the firstborn. In order to be in the church of the firstborn, you have to be sealed to your spouse. They are they into whose hands the Father has given all things. They are they who are priests and kings who have received of his fullness and of his glory and are priests of the Most High after the order of Melchizedek, who, at, who was after the order of Enoch, which was after the order of the only begotten Son. Wherefore, as it is written, they are gods, even the sons of God. Wherefore, all things are theirs, whether life or death, or things present or things to come, all are theirs, and they are Christ's. And Christ is God's, and they shall overcome all things. Wherefore, let no man glory in man, but rather let him glory in God, who shall subdue all enemies under his feet. There shall dwell in the presence of God and his Christ forever and ever. These are they whom he shall bring with him when he shall come in the clouds of glory to, and the clouds of heaven to reign on the earth over his people. These are they who shall have part in the first resurrection. These are they who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just. These are they who, shall, who come up unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly place, the holiest of all. These are they who have come to an innumerable company of angels to, in the, to the general assembly and church of Enoch and of the firstborn. These are they whose names are written in heaven, whose God and Christ who's where God and Christ are, the judge of all. These are they who are just men made perfect through Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, who wrought out this perfect atonement through the shedding of his own blood. These are they whose bodies are celestial, whose glory is that of the sun, even the glory of God, the highest of all, whose glory, the sun of the firmament, is written of as being typical. And then Paul goes on and says, and bodies terrestrial, and then in the Joseph Smith translation, it adds, and bodies telestial. But the glory of the celestial one, and the, glory, and the terrestrial another, and the telestial another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So if you go back to section 76, uh, and also section 88, uh, you'll read more about uh, the, the types of bodies that we'll receive in the resurrection, whether they be celestial, terrestrial, or telestial. All men shall gain physical perfection in the resurrection. In Alma, it says, The soul shall be restored to the body, and the body to the soul. Yea, and every limb and joint shall be restored to its body. Yea, even a hair of the head shall not be lost, but all things shall be restored to their perfect frame. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body or an immortal body. 
when he says spiritual body, he doesn't mean a body just made up of spirit, but he means a body that is that is made of flesh and bones, but that spirit matter is what flows in the veins, not blood. Verse 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, meaning Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that which is natural first, and not that which is spiritual, but afterwards, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have been born... As we have borne the image of the earthy, meaning Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly, meaning Christ. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the sound of the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and, and we shall be changed." For this, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on incorruption, or immortality, then shall it be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. President Kimball said, Paul says, the death of sting, the sting of death is sin, meaning that if men die in their sins, they will suffer the prescribed penalty and gain a lesser glory in the realms ahead. Gordon B. Hinckley said, The pain of death is swallowed up in the peace of eternal life. Whenever the cold hand of death strikes, there shines through the gloom and the darkness of that hour the triumphant figure of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, the Son of God, who by his matchless and eternal power overcame death, he is our comfort, our only true comfort, when the dark shroud of earthly Night closes about us as the Spirit departs the human form. Verse 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through, the, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So there's a lot there about baptisms for the dead, and the reason that Paul just barely touches the surface of baptisms for the dead is because he understood that the people in Corinth already understood the doctrine, so that's why he doesn't explain it. But he's he's arguing about resurrection by saying, why are we? Why do they then baptize for the dead? And so uh, that was something that they knew, and uh, now you know more about it and can understand it better. And this uh, this is the end of the chapter, and we'll see you next time. Bye.